here's some of his ranting during the interactions with the team caught on the ring doorbell camera that they installed. You want uh, you want rats in here too? No. Then eat the food. You're gonna try to steak it in here, and you know you don't need dinner. You get mom an attitude. You know you might rattle her a little bit because she's you know a cares and she tries to give you the love, but you don't fool me. You think you're a bad? You're smart. You've done the I've done all the you're doing before you were ever born. You can't mess and fool me, but I did learn. And I changed. If you don't learn to change, not so smart. You say you're smart, but you don't change. You just break your own. You rip your own stuff down. Who is it, huh? Not me. You know that. You know the answer. To All right, if you've already got your mind made up so far, is there anything the defense could possibly do to change it? Think about that question for just a moment. I'm going to bring in our legal eagles to answer it. In the studio, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Noah Pines is with me, remotely family law attorney Michelle Thomas, and former criminal defense attorney, uh, the guy who famously represented Jody Arias, Kirk Nurmi. Uh, and we're matching again a little bit, Kirk. Everybody in the control room saying, what's up with you and Kirk Nurmi? Always dressing alike. I love it. If I want to match anybody, it's going to be, uh, be you, my friend. Mad respect. All right, so let's get down to it. Null Pros Noah, I want to go to you first on this one. My new nickname for you after that huge Null Pros you got in the state of Georgia. Um, what can the defense do at this point? Well, I mean, the defense, look, look Julie, I, I know you have strong feelings about this case. Um, you and I agree a lot, not on this one. When parents are, you know, if they didn't do anything with this child and he went and did something at a school, mass shooting or hurt somebody or killed somebody or did something, you'd go, where are the parents? What are they doing? You know, it's not a box. It's a room. It's eight by eight. It's not a jail cell. Um, did it have a bathroom? No. Um, but what the parents need to do or what he needs to do in his defense is let the jury understand really the whole picture of what got them to that point. And it's, you know, parents have the right to discipline their child. The question typically is whether it's reasonable. In the state of Georgia, it's actually an affirmative defense. Parental discipline is an affirmative defense in the state of Georgia, which means the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what they were doing was not reasonable discipline. Okay, Noah Pines. Let me go to our other guest, Michelle Thomas. Family law is what you do. What do you think about this, please? Oh, this is tough. This is really tough and it's hard to listen to. It's one thing to discipline your child. It's another thing to treat them as the other. Let them, making them know that they are not part of the family. And not only did this defendant treat this, their child, uh, because legally there's no distinction between an adopted child and a biological child, they literally placed him outdoors, outside of the house to let him know that he is not part of this family. And so when you add to you know, locking him in a room, not, not giving him a place to uh, relieve himself. Um, and then when you hear the yelling and the raging uh, by this parent, you know, if it's discipline, what did he, what, what did he do? So it's not as though we've seen, okay, today he went to school, he punched a child, he did something aggressive, and then they put him in this box. No, that was the routine. That was their daily routine with with this child for years. And so we go far beyond the level of discipline here to, I think, the point of abuse. Michelle Thomas, thank you for all of that great points. Uh, Kirk Nurmi, uh, break the tie for us here. What are you thinking? Well, Julie, I think it's not just our clothing that matches, but our attitude about Mr. Ferrer that's <laughs> in alignment this morning here as well. Um, to me, there's no excuse for abuse, right? But I think that uh, Noah makes some great points regarding the parenting and the issues because, you know, if the defense is going to do anything, I think really Mr. Ferreter has to take the stand and has to say, I love this, the victim, I love my other children, and I was doing the best I could to protect them, raise them, discipline them, that sort of thing, and try to connect with the jury about the difficult job that parenting is and try to advance my defense in that manner. That's the only way they have to break through. But again, they're going to have to get past the, the mantra that I think the prosecutor should say several times in closing that there's no excuse for abuse.
Oh, I like that, Kirk Nurmi. There's no excuse for abuse. You're right. They should plaster that on the big projector screen and let the jury stare at it uh, while they close. All right, so we know Tracy Ferreter's case is on deck. The two were joined. They were then severed. They still are joined in marriage and uh, quite literally holding hands as they go into the courtroom together. They were even spotted sharing a kiss uh, before Tim's court day started one day last week. We may have that video, not quite sure. But at any rate, we know that he turns his back and has quick chats with his wife uh, when there are breaks in the action in the courtroom. And the question is, was she complicit? We know we saw that uh, video being played for the jury. We heard it on court TV over the fight over the air conditioning and you hear both of their voices on that tape. Did you turn the air on in your room? Yes. Are you supposed to touch that? Did you hear Baba? Yes. Did you hear his question? No. Are you supposed to touch air conditioning? No. Why did you touch it? It was getting hot. I don't give a shit. it's getting hot. You're a tough guy. You don't touch the air conditioning. I'll deal with you tomorrow on that. Oh, who's going to be the tough guy if Tim Ferreter goes to prison? You know, what will the jury do? They're going to return a verdict one way or the other, and will it affect Tracy Ferreter's case? Because she's number two to go to trial. Let me turn back to my legal eagles, Noah Pines. What do you say about how this might affect her case? That was a bad clip for him. I didn't like it. Not so So, good. Not so good. You're coming around, Noah. You're coming around. (laughs) Look, it's a hard case. I mean, the question is, what were they trying to do? Why were they doing it? But anyway, um, you know, of course, it's a preview for the wife to see what happens to the husband. If he gets convicted, that's not good for her. If he gets sent to prison for a long time, you know, that may change her decision as what she wants to do with her case. Obviously, if it's husband and wife and this is going on, they're both responsible. Mm-hmm. Unless she's, of mm-hmm. course, reporting the husband to the police, which I don't think she was. Right. Yeah, don't think so. Uh, Michelle Thomas, what do you say about Tracy Ferreter's case, please? Yeah, I mean, I think there's enough evidence here, hearing her voice on in that particular clip he played, to show that she was complicit in this treatment and in this behavior. So whatever the outcome is for her husband, she's definitely going to take that into consideration and most likely accept a plea to the extent that he's convicted and serves more than the two years he was offered. Michelle, thank you. Kirk Nurmi, last but certainly not least, uh, should Tracy Ferreter be worried? I think so. I mean, I think odds are that Mr. Ferreter is headed towards a guilty verdict, and that is likely, as has been said, has been a preview of the verdict that she's going to face. So, you know, if that verdict is as we think it's going to be, she should be running to the prosecutor begging for a plea. And But, you know, who knows? I think both of them have acted with a, a level of hubris. I know we know he rejected a, a plea offer for 24 months. I believe she probably got a very similar offer in fairness, and they both maybe have this defiant attitude which is not going to serve them well both in terms of their choice to go to trial in terms of the ultimate prison sentence that they face right and kirk uh, that's a good offer is it not you've seen a lot of offers over the years in criminal court what do you think 24 months for this conduct yeah, that's a great offer. I mean, I would be showing up to, you know, the clients that were meeting with my client with a pen in hand and putting it in his or her hand and saying, listen, this is what you got to do. These are the facts. The jury is not going to like you. I've told that to clients straight in their face. The jury is not going to like you. You can go to trial if you want. It's your life. But ultimately, the jury is not going to like you when they see these pictures. They see this structure you built. You see this bucket. Those images are indelible. They're going to be hard to get over. And, you know, the saddest part of all of this might be that we don't see any of the ferreters expressing love towards their son in any of this, in any of these discussions. And that's going to turn off the jury as well. So they would be better served taking the plea. But, you know, uh, the choices have consequences, Julie. Oh, definitely. Oh, and the rejection of that plea agreement, it has consequences. I mean, I guess he thought that he deserved better than that. Michelle Thomas, I think the Ferreters are delusional. That's just me. I think they're delusional. Uh, Your thoughts, please. Oh, you hit the nail right on the head. It blows my mind (laughs) that this defendant rejected that two-year uh, plea knowing what was what the evidence was knowing that they had these videotapes and you know where it's like you know earth to the defendant so I really think delusional is the exact right word and and there's a lot of ego 
um, involved here and just belief and, and superiority, quite frankly, um, is, uh, emanating from this defendant, I think it's going to backfire. Yes. Oh, beautifully said. Perfect note to end on. Michelle Thomas, Kirk Nurmi, thank you both so much for weighing in. We'll see you back here on opening statements soon. And Noel Pross, Noah Pines is going to be sure. staying with me as we're going into our next segments. Here's what we have coming up next for you here on opening statements. I get there and I'm like, like, oh, she's out. I'm like, okay, we gotta go back to the city. She clearly came from up top. Oh, yeah. Her, her injuries were definitely Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. oh, this is so sad. Look at this beautiful young woman, Taylor Gruwell. Her father is joining us next, live here on the program, to talk about her mysterious death plummeting from the top of a parking deck. And we're gearing up for a big day of testimony today, friends. Guess who's set to take the stand? This young woman, Maya Kowalski, in her case. Her case became famous through the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. The civil trial is playing out right now in Florida. We'll take you live when Court TV Live begins at 9. Florida father accused of locking his son in a box in the garage with a bed, a bucket, and a camera. He was locked in a room for hours at a time. Police say this abuse went unnoticed for years. There are ring videos that the state provided of the child lying. He faces up to 40 years. I'm not sure they're going to be able to justify it. What's going on in this house? The Boy in a Box Trial. Live coverage today on Court TV.